My name is uh, Marco Gersebeck. Uh, I'm originally from Germany uh, and uh, did my undergrad uh, there at the University of Mainz. And uh, then uh, while, while at Mainz, I, I spent uh, a year abroad in, in Glasgow and then uh, ended up doing my PhD there uh, in, in Glasgow. And at that time, I, I joined the, the LHCB experiment uh, where, where I've been working since. So that was, that was back in, in 2006. Uh, actually, uh, uh, during my time in Glasgow, I, I uh, spent a lot of time uh, with another PhD student with, with whom I shared a flat from, from Madagascar. So uh, I have some, some uh, very fond mem memories of, of our time together up, uh, up north. Um, and then from, uh, uh, fr from, from Glasgow, I moved to, to CERN where I was lucky to get a CERN fellowship uh, after finishing my PhD and uh, I spent three years uh, over, over there. I actually had moved to CERN throughout, uh, in sort of halfway through my PhD, which is quite a typical thing here in the UK um, that uh, uh, students spend uh, something like one and a half years or so um, at a research lab if, if they do an experimental PhD and I, I, I did the, the same thing. Um, and then it so happened that my supervisor uh, was on sabbatical at CERN, so I just stayed there all, all the time till the end. And then obviously uh, when, when I was a CERN fellow there. Um, and then moving on from there, I, I was able to get a fellowship uh, from the UK Research Council um, to continue working on, on LHCB. Uh, and, and that was uh, based at the University of Manchester. However, uh, throughout that fellowship, I remained uh, at CERN. So in total, I spent something like uh, uh, nine and a half years um, at, at CERN before uh, finally uh, moving uh, to, to Manchester, uh, where, where I then, after my fellowship, took up a lectureship. And, and, and now I'm a, I'm a reader here. Uh, for, for those of you not familiar with that, uh, with, with that concept, uh, that, that's uh, uh, in, in other parts of the world sometimes called associate uh, professor. Um, and yeah, now I, I do uh, plenty of teaching. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be able to do a fair bit of my teaching in areas quite closely related to, to my research. Um, so similar to the, the lecture I'll, I'll give now, uh, I'm giving a lecture on, on flavor physics. Um, and uh, I, I also have a, a third year laboratory course uh, where uh, students get to analyze LHCB data. So this was an, uh, a data set from, from 2011 uh, that was released as open data. So, so everyone has access to it. Um, and uh, this is something we, we very successfully use with, with our students. And, and thankfully is, is, is quite useful at the moment also because it can be taught uh, remotely uh, quite uh, uh, straightforwardly. Um, so uh, that, that comes in handy. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's me uh, right now. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, working on LHCB. Um, I've uh, been working there mostly on charm physics. Uh, I'll say a little bit about, about that as well. Um, and uh, I, I've more recently also worked on, on semi-leptonic uh, decays a little bit. I'm uh, not covering that today. Um, and other than that, uh, I got involved with the MUTUE experiment at Fermilab um, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, there, uh, we were looking for, for muon to electron uh, conversion in, in nuclei. So that's a process that violates uh, lepton flavor. And if, if, if found would be an unambiguous sign for, for physics beyond the standard model. Uh, so that's an experiment that uh, is, is currently in construction and, and due to start in a, in a couple of years time, roughly. Um, yeah, and um, in, in Manchester, uh, as I uh, hope I will show you <clears throat> at the end of the lecture, uh, we do a broad range of physics, so we, we've got quite a uh, quite a broad uh, uh, and, and, and very young team. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm currently the, the team leader uh, of of, of uh, uh, the, the the group here, and we, we've got sort of 25, 30 uh, uh, people all together, around about half of whom are PhD students, and and, and the other uh, half are staff, and. Uh, we work on all sorts of aspects of, of flavor physics within uh, within LHCB. 
and um, in in addition to the analysis, uh, we we are also quite heavily involved on the hardware side. So we're building uh, one of the uh, um, sub detector components, the the, the vertex detector. Um, I'll say a few more words about that during the lecture. Uh, so so we're, we're building that right now, and at the moment, where at, at least over here, access to the offices and so on is, is very restricted. The only thing that's going on in terms of particle physics in the building itself is uh, the, the construction of, uh, of, of these vertex detector modules. Now I'll show you a picture of one uh, towards the end of the lecture. Um, yeah, and, and I guess that's, that's more or less me. Do you want me to carry on with the lecture? Yes, now let's go to the lecture. Thank you. All right. Uh, so let me try to share the share the screen. Um, I'll try sharing the application and I'll go into full screen. Can I just check whether you can see the full screen? Yes, version? you can. Yes. Perfect. OK. All right, then let's get going. Uh, it's, it's certainly my, my great pleasure and honor to, to uh, uh, be able to give this lecture uh, to you um, about flavor physics. As I just described, it's, it's a topic that I've been working on uh, for, for quite a few years now. And there's certainly uh, quite a lot of uh, excitement around it. We've got quite a, quite a lot of new results. Um, and I'll actually cover uh, uh, sort of our, our latest highlights uh, as, as, as part of this lecture. Before I get started, though, one thing I wanted to uh, point out as well is a conference that uh, we hope to host here uh, in, in person, if at all possible, uh, next summer. That's the Lepton Photon uh, Conference. This is uh, one of the longest standing conference uh, series in, in particle physics. And uh, we, we have the honor of hosting that uh, next, next August. Um, there'll be quite a broad program. And, and, and one of the things we really hope to achieve with that conference is uh, an inclusive uh, um, uh, event uh, for, for uh, physicists uh, um, of all descriptions, be that uh, gender inclusivity, uh, uh, but, but also very much regional uh, inclusivity. So uh, uh, we very much hope that we have a good participation also, also from Africa and uh, we, we should have some support available uh, so uh, I, I've got the, the Indico link there. At the moment, registration isn't open yet, but once it is, uh, I, I would encourage uh, everyone interested to have a look uh, and, and, and to apply uh, if, if, if they need any help uh, with, uh, with, with attending. Right. Um, before I dive in to, to my lecture, I just want to recap uh, a little bit. Uh, so, so what I'm talking about today will be uh, very much following the lectures uh, that, that Sally uh, gave in May and, and that Monica gave uh, uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, so uh, they both described how, how flavor physics is uh, um, very much precision measurements, both of CP asymmetries and, and, and rare processes to, to measure standard model parameters on the one side, but also to discover uh, new physics, that's physics beyond the standard model by comparison of, of, of this, uh, these standard model parameters with predictions or uh, simply by observing processes that are forbidden or are, are uh, unobservably small uh, within the standard model. More specifically then, um, both of them also looked at uh, CP violation and uh, CP violation is, is, is one of the Sakharov uh, conditions to explain the baryon asymmetry of the universe. So we know that we need to have a sizable amount of CP violation. Um, and within the standard model, CP violation in hadrons at least is governed by the, by the CKM matrix. That process is well understood um, thanks to the uh, discoveries in the, in, the, in the Kaon sector and, and the beauty sector. Uh, confirming exactly uh, uh, the, the uh, kobayashi Maskawa uh, mechanism. Um, however, we also know that the CP violation in the standard model is far too small to explain the baryon asymmetry in the universe. So we need something else. We need new sources of CP violation. And that can come from physics beyond the standard model contributing to CP violation 
in hadrons. That's uh, the, the thing uh, we're, we're looking for very much at LHCB or CP violation in other processes. And, and of course, neutrinos are um, an area that, that uh, of course, receives growing attention with, with sort of first hints of, of uh, uh, what, what CP violation might, might look like uh, over there. Right. So in this lecture, uh, I want to uh, focus a little bit more on, on how we actually measure CP violation. So I want to give this very much an experimental um, focus. Um, so to start with, uh, I, I have to introduce the LHCB experiment so, so you uh, get to know what is the, the apparatus that we do the measurements with. And then um, I want to take two case studies, and these are both uh, recent uh, discoveries. One is, is, is just about a month old. Uh, that's a discovery of time-dependent CP violation in, in BS decays. And the other one is the discovery of CP violation in, in charm mesons, the D0 mesons, um, which is uh, a bit over a year old now. So I will take these and I will describe uh, in detail uh, what are the uh, important aspects that enabled us to make these discoveries. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I hope you, you can take away from the lecture is, is, is really the, the knowledge of how to combine the, the aspects that are important in the measurements uh, and how, how to combine these with the, the detector components and, and how, they, how, how they all come together, why, why we build the experiment uh, in, in, in the way uh, uh, as, as, as we have done. Right. So let me get started with LHCB. This is uh, a photo of, uh, of, of the detector. Um, I will go through the different components uh, in, in a moment. Um, let me just point out that the proton-proton collisions are somewhere uh, happening out here. And then the, the LHCB detector, as you can see, has sort of this wedge uh, shape uh, here out, out to the left. So there's, there's nothing more to the, to the right. The, the uh, interaction region is in a, is in a, in, in a small alcove uh, just that, that is sort of cut out of the, of the right-hand wall as you, as you look at the cavern here. And the uh, LHC beam runs horizontally uh, through this. And here in the, in the center, you can see the beam pipe just between these uh, rows of LEDs, the, the sort of horizontal pipe that you can imagine running through there. That's the that's the beam part where the uh, where the LHC beams uh, run uh, uh, through the, the protons run through and then as I mentioned there on the right hand side they would uh, they would collide. Right. Let me tell you a little bit more about the collisions and 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 about why the LHCB experiment looks as it does, which is very different uh, to uh, pretty much all other uh, experiments uh, that that uh, you may be uh, familiar with. So here we have uh, we, we have two protons, and if we look at them in, in a bit more detail, actually what matters uh, at LHC energy scales is the constituents of the protons, the, the quarks and, 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 and the gluons. And if we bring them to collide, uh, we can, we can uh, then focus on, on just the partons that participate in the collision. So in this case, I have this, this, this uh, squiggly line there, uh, which uh, uh, depicts a gluon, and then I, I have a, a, a quark on, on, on the other side, and those two, uh, I, I say, are, are colliding here. The other partons will not, uh, will, will not interact, and they will continue uh, uh, and, and, and uh, dissociate and, 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 and form, form other fragments. Uh, but, but the main collision is just happening between these two partons, and then what matters is what fraction of the proton momentum these partons carry. So um, this is a probability distribution uh, for, for, for each of them. And uh, of course, the most likely case is that the two fractions uh, are not the same. So the proton as a whole has a well-defined energy that's given by the, by the collider that's uh, uh, in, in the latest case would have been six and a half tera electron volts. But these individual constituents, they have a random fraction between zero and 100% of that in principle. So only if you have both carrying a very uh, large amount of energy 
uh, and, and a symmetric collision, you get these beautiful collisions going out uh, uh, laterally uh, um, that uh, are recorded then by, by ATLAS and CMS and that uh, uh, could potentially produce particles, very, very heavy particles exceeding a mass of, of uh, one TV. But what we're interested in is the many collisions where this setup is asymmetric, where one of the uh, partons carries a larger uh, fraction of the proton's momentum and the other one a very small amount. And what happens then, um, if, if you work through the calculation of the center of mass energy of such a collision, of two objects with very different momenta, you will find that the center of mass energy is, is much reduced. And in fact, the center of mass energy uh, will then very often be in the range of giga electron volts. And that is exactly the mass range of, uh, of, of, of the hadrons that, that we want to analyze, okay? So this is uh, uh, how, how these, how these uh, hadrons are then often produced. But what's more is if you have an asymmetric uh, collision like that, where the gluon carries a lot of the proton's momentum, the other uh, uh, guy coming from the right carries very little, what you end up with is a, is a collision that is sort of boosted to the right-hand side. And that is exactly what we observe then in the LHCB detector. And this is a very typical uh, picture. So you can see here the um, angular distribution of the B quark and the anti-B quark. They always have to be produced in a pair because there is no intrinsic uh, B quark content in the, uh, in the proton. And you see that they are both uh, uh, produced predominantly at similar angles. Either this is the forward direction, the red area here is, is what's covered by the LHCB detector. And you see predominantly they are both in the forward direction or of course in the in a backward direction that is uh, the, the the inverse uh, picture but there we don't have a detector and it's certainly not worth building that second detector excavating that cavern uh, for for just a factor of square root two in in, in statistics oh michael so, there is a question uh, okay cola could you want to talk yeah uh, so what i wanted to find out is um if if if, if do, do is it possible to get the, the the particles that you're looking for from a symmetric collision? Yes. Uh, uh, th thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, um, b before I continue, I I, I want to say absolutely. Please uh, do do interrupt, and I, I will try and bring up the the chat so I can I can have a, a an eye on that as well. But Kitevi, please. Interrupt no, I will me. I will I will uh, follow the chat for you. Um, okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, uh, absolutely, they, they, they can be produced in, in, in symmetric collisions as well. Um, first of all, you can have the case that both constituents have a relatively small uh, amount of energy, but symmetric. So you can still get the low center of mass energy that would favor the production of, of, of these hadrons. Um, but then they, 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 they would uh, uh, more uh, uh, go at, at larger angles, um, so uh, that that would correspond to the to the area sort of in the center of this uh, of of this diagram, and these uh, points here they are not at zero, right? It, it's, it's it's not really visible, but they are not at zero. Okay, so uh, there, there there is certainly a, a, um, a measurable amount, and that is indeed what, for instance, Atlas and CMS use when they measure um, properties of, of, of these hadrons. They, they can do a certain amount of flavor physics. Um, I will, in the, in the rest of the lecture, describe a number of aspects that are specific to us and, and, and that you really need for, for certain uh, measurements that Atlas and CMS can't do. But for instance, things uh, where things decay into muons, they're a bit easier to detect. Um, that is certainly something they can do, and that happens with uh, with me mesons that are produced uh, uh, in in the in the central regions from from symmetric collisions. And of course, mesons can also be produced in collisions that set free uh, a greater amount of energy. Right? Uh, that just means you you produce either more particles or 
uh, particles with a with, with a greater uh, kinetic energy, um, but but it's it's certainly not kinematically forbidden uh, uh, to produce uh, uh, B mesons or what have you uh, in 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 higher energy uh, uh, symmetric collisions. So all of that is uh, is is possible, and that is something that um, that Atlas and CMS, uh, for instance, have have access to. Um, the LHCB detector has just been designed to cover this this very forward region. Um, because that's where most of uh, most of these um, uh, uh, B quarks and also charm quarks are, are being produced. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it did. Because my follow-up question would have been, um, uh, how do you how do you know that they come from if if these uh, particles come from symmetric or asymmetric collisions? But then you answered me with the right. The, 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 the forward angle, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so the forward angle gives us uh, uh, a hint that uh, it, it is actually not a definite clue, right? So you could have the case that you have a symmetric collision and there's so much going on. There are so many different particles being produced and some of them are B hadrons that happen to be in the forward region and we only see them. So we can't really say anything about what exactly happened, how symmetric that collision was. As you will see in a moment, uh, we, we can say something about the particles uh, around the interaction point, um, but we don't really, uh, we, we can't really reconstruct the full collision, but we also don't really have to. That, that is uh, uh, kind of the, the physics of that is, is decoupled from, from the physics that, uh, that, that we want to focus on. Okay, any, any further questions on, on this bit? If not, I will, I will go on. So um, another thing we, we do at LHCB, uh, and I'll only mention it briefly, is we, we displace the beams. So we don't collide them head on. We displace the beams, at least at the start of a fill. So what you see here is what we call page one of the, of the LHC. So this is something you can uh, uh, check on the web when the LHC is running and you see here the intensity and you see here the curves for Atlas and CMS and for LHCB that is that is stable and that is because we, we uh, displace the beam such that on average whenever these protons uh, uh, um, cross each other there are you can imagine uh, uh, that there are clouds of 10 to the 11 protons coming along and, and uh, uh, crossing each other and we want only on average one of them to interact. Uh, so, so that's what we achieve by, by sort of displacing the beams. And as the beams lose intensity, we bring them closer and closer together, uh, such that we maintain this average of one interaction. Uh, and, and that is very useful to, to have very stable experimental conditions. And then this is the, the, the data set that we've collected so far, around about nine uh, inverse femtobarns uh, throughout uh, throughout uh, run uh, uh, runs one and two, I think actually this is this is not the very latest plot. I, I just realized it doesn't go all the way up to nine, but we've we've got the nine uh, uh, complete now. Right. So this is uh, another picture of the LHCB detector. Uh, you, you saw the photo earlier already. Um, all the sketches, for some reason are showing the LHCB detector from the other side. So this is just uh, um, looking uh, uh, from, from, from the different side. Uh, on this side, there's, there's not enough space to take a nice picture. So either we need to cheat and mirror the picture uh, or uh, we, need to, we need to live with, uh, with, with this inversion. So this is a, uh, an even more schematic sketch. And I will now briefly talk through the different elements of the, of the, of the detector, starting with the vertex locator. And I'll spend a little bit more time on that because, as I mentioned already, this is something we're quite involved in here in Manchester, and I've been involved uh, with that uh, since the since the start of my uh, PhD. Um, what you see on the right hand side here in the top picture is the view that the protons would have as they go down the LHC uh, beam pipe. This foil here uh, that you see. Uh, on the on the right uh, on the left uh, they, that separates the beam vacuum that basically you're, you're sitting in in this view from the detector 
vacuum. So the detector itself sits in a vacuum, but it's separated from, from the beam vacuum. Um, and um, the detectors look uh, as, as uh, shown down here. So, so this is uh, a section of them. Each of these uh, modules that you see has two silicon sensors. So these are two sort of semicircular uh, disks. Those are the silicon sensors. And you see there, uh, you can probably just about make out here, there are two of them uh, glued onto it uh, from, from, from both sides. And these would sit behind uh, this, this foil on either side. And then actually when the beam is declared stable uh, by, the, by the machine experts, then these two halves would be moved together and what's left is then only a tiny hole uh, in the middle. That foil uh, would then be just five millimeters uh, away from the LHC beams. And the first bit of, of silicon here would be seven millimeters away from, from the beams. So uh, we, we have to be quite careful uh, with, the, with, with the positioning here. The hit resolution that we achieve with this is uh, better, than, better than 10 microns. Um, and what we'll do with that, I'll explain uh, right now. So on the top, you see one of the best, very first collisions uh, that we recorded. And the sensors um, that, we, that make up the detector can measure either the radial uh, uh, coordinate or the angular uh, coordinate. Uh, and, and you see here the, the individual strips that recorded hits uh, uh, indicated. And if you, if you cross the... Uh, the two uh, sensor types, uh, the, the um, information from there, you can reconstruct uh, particle trajectories. And that's what you see here with the, with the blue lines. And you see they, they, they meet here in the center. And this would be the collision point. Now, if we zoom in and look just at this central region here, so the whole thing here is about half a meter, what's shown here. If we zoom in to about a centimeter width, we can see all these particles meeting up in the proton-proton collision point. And then there's one. So this blue line uh, has, uh, is, is made up actually of, of these two purple lines. The purple ones are the ones that are uh, recorded. Those are uh, muons, a mu plus and a mu minus. And those are being recorded by the vertex detector and subsequent uh, uh, detectors. And if you bring them together, uh, you see they, they uh, originate in a, in a point here, and that point is well displaced from the primary uh, collision point. And that is a characteristic signature for um, heavy flavor decay. So those are weak decays. They, uh, the, these, these particles travel a certain distance, a few millimeters as shown here, and um, uh, th this, is, this is how the reconstructed picture looks like. This particular decay, uh, BS to, to mu plus mu minus, actually doesn't happen very often. It only happens in three times 10 to the minus nine of all B sub S decays. And it, it's so rare that it took the uh, combined power of LHCB and CMS to discover uh, that, um, uh, that, that decay a, a few years ago. So uh, th this is this is one of the major uh, discoveries in, in flavor physics of the, of the last few years. Marco, there is a question precisely, I think, about, uh, about uh, PyLab. Yeah. Um, OK. So yeah. um, first, I think Cola then, uh, oh, he sent it to me privately. But he said if uh, LHCB is uh, able to achieve one interaction for a bunch crossing, why can't Atlas and CMS do the same? Uh, they could. Um, however, uh, we do this precisely because we have this uh, um, displaced B sub S decay uh, or, or similar decays that we want to reconstruct. And one thing that is very important is to identify this dis displaced uh, decay vertex that you see here. If um, there were other uh, uh, interactions present, then this could lead to, to a confusion uh, of uh, where this comes from and possibly uh, uh, make us miss that particular decay because the, another proton-proton collision might happen much closer. And then it looks like this is just two muons coming, coming from the interaction point. So that's why we want to 
uh, to uh, drive this down to a single interaction. Now, Atlas and CMS, they mostly look uh, for very heavy particles. Um, and uh, there, in, in most cases, this is not always uh, the, the case, but in most cases, it doesn't matter so much exactly which proton-proton uh, um, uh, collision uh, that comes from. Uh, so they just want to maximize their discovery potential and they want to study as many collisions as possible. So that, that's why they, they don't separate the beams, but they take more or less whatever they can get. Now, have, having said that, they also have some ability of separating them because they're nicely uh, uh, spread out along the beam line uh, over a certain distance. And in that direction, they can actually separate them reasonably well. So uh, it, it, it's not all just one big ball of, of, of confusion. So, so they also have some uh, uh, separating power. And um, so they, they do that. They now uh, are planning to or have, they, they've certainly trialed uh, a similar uh, uh, separation as I've described for LHCB, because also for them, it's advantageous not to use the very busiest events because there are reasons for which also they are interested in identifying the right vertex and uh, at some point that is no longer possible and so they they are also doing something to to uh, uh, reduce the, the the very maximum uh, luminosity uh, at the same time we're going the opposite way with the upgrade that we will in or that we're in the process of installing, we will go to a regime in which we have about five interactions happening um, at any given proton-proton uh, uh, collision, and um, from our experience with the detector so far, we're certain that we can cope with uh, with, with that amount. You can't dial uh, uh, into to having. Uh, um, having exactly one collision every time. This is simply a Poisson statistics that you're following there. So we have already a good sample with multiple collisions and we've seen that uh, whatever detrimental effect comes with that is something that we can handle. And, and therefore we've decided to, to go uh, uh, also to a few more collisions per, per bunch crossing in order to, to acquire uh, our data more quickly. There's another question from Meiki. Meiki. Uh, yeah, yeah. How long it takes uh, for the BB collision to take place, if, if, if it can be measured? Maybe. So the, the, the collision itself um, is, uh, is, is, is basically instantaneous. So, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the proton bunches, they are separated uh, in the in the LHC by uh, eight meters if, if the LHC is, 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 is completely packed. So um, they happen, the collisions happen every 25 nanoseconds. Okay, the, but, but the collision process itself that that is that is instantaneous. Um, what you can uh, measure is then the time of travel of, 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 of these uh, BS decays, but of course they, they they travel practically at the speed of light, so um, you you can you can work out how long it takes uh, for for a particle at the speed of light to travel five millimeters, yeah. um, and 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 that that gives you sort of the time scale. This is actually a relevant time scale that we need to take into account because these particles travel, uh, of course. A certain distance you see here this is uh, a half half a meter right and at the speed of light half a meter is already a couple of nanoseconds and we have when when we read out these silicon detectors we have to tune the point in time when we read them out to about one nanosecond um, be, because the the, the uh, analog pulse shape uh, of, of, of of the signal that they produce uh, is so short that, that that we have to really hit the right point. So it really matters where these collisions happen, uh, and and how we how we tune these detectors to to uh, have have a have a good readout. So so all all these all these subtle effects are not negligible. They they, they need to be taken into account. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mohammed uh, Mohammed has a question. You want to read your question, Mohammed? Uh, 
um, okay, he says on the chat, maybe the professor can repeat again the part of how, how doesn't the detector accommodate five events per PP collision? Um, right. So the, 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 the challenge with that, let, let, me, let me go to the next slide because there I, I, I will explain how we identify uh, the, uh, the, the uh, heavy flavor collisions and, 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 and hopefully this, this will become uh, uh, clearer. So I want to introduce here uh, what we call the impact parameter. And what this is, it is the, the shortest distance between the, the uh, primary proton-proton uh, uh, collision point and the extrapolated trajectory of a particle. Okay, so in this case, I've, uh, I've extrapolated the mu minus trajectory uh, to the back here, and the impact parameter would then be this, this distance here. So if this B sub S decay had not happened out here, but had happened here, this impact parameter would be much smaller, right? If the B sub S decay would be further away, then the impact parameter uh, would uh, would take a larger value. Of course, this depends on the angle of the of the mu minus. But unless this muon is exactly flying in the same direction as my BS decay, I will always get a non-zero impact parameter. And therefore, if I have at least two particles, then one of them will have an angle with respect to the uh, uh, B sub S at the very least. And so at least one of them will have a non-zero impact parameter. So that makes this impact parameter a very powerful tool in selecting these decays that come from a displaced, what we call a displaced vertex. And that is an uh, absolute dead certain characteristic of a weak decay, because only weak decays happen so slowly that the particles can travel a measurable distance. Okay. So now I come back to the to, to the question: What happens uh, uh, with when 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 we have five proton proton collisions? Now, imagine there's not just this point, but uh, that uh, we have, let's say, one point there, one point there, and one point there, and and maybe even one point over here. Okay. Now, then I have one impact parameter, I have a second impact parameter, I have a third impact parameter, and I have a fourth impact parameter. I don't know a priori which proton-proton collision this muon comes from. Even, even this last guy here uh, is a possibility because um, the muon, the first measurement of the muon is far outside this picture. Um, and so I, I don't know whether it originated somewhere here or here or, or, or down here. So, so I, I, I can't really say, oh, it, but it came from, from, from this place. So um, if, you have, if you have several proton-proton collisions, you, you've got several possible impact parameters. And in our reconstruction, what we typically assume is that the smallest impact parameter is the correct one. Now, that would be this guy uh, in this example which obviously is, is, is not the correct one. And also it might be so small that we then dismiss the particle because uh, it, it may not be measurably far away from, from, that, from that primary proton-proton uh, uh, collision. So um, now you, you, you could say, okay, uh, in this case, okay, we might be unlucky that uh, this would lead us to dismiss that, but let's remove uh, this proton-proton uh, uh, collision, and let's say with sorry with, with 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 sort of these three impact parameters, they're all large enough, and we would accept the muon. Okay, fine. However, then go one step further. Now, what we also want to uh, measure, and I haven't uh, uh, mentioned that yet, but but I will come to it uh, a bit later, is the decay time of the uh, B sub S meson. And what's relevant for that is the uh, flight path. Uh, so the distance between this decay point and the primary proton-proton collision. Now, if I think 
that this proton-proton collision here is the one that fits best. I will only use this bit here as the decay path, whereas this is the correct decay path. So I, I will massively underestimate the distance of travel and therefore the decay time of the particle and this will completely mess up the, the, the measurement uh, I'm, I'm, I'm making. So this is the biggest danger of multiple proton-proton uh, uh, collisions. Uh, and, and, and that's something that uh, uh, one, one needs to deal with when, when one uh, works with, with multiple collisions. Okay? So this is why we want to avoid, uh, or, or so far wanted to avoid as much as possible having more than one uh, uh, collision. However, when you work with, 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 with this uh, um, in, in a scenario that, that you have multiple decays, the uh, fact that you end up confusing one uh, is relatively rare and then leads to a certain dilution that you can take into account. And so long as that is the case, that you can take it into account, then you can avoid it biasing your measurement and uh, up to a point that is then acceptable. And that's sort of the regime that we want to work in um, in, uh, in, 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 in the next few years. So we, we sort of buy in a, a certain bias of our measurements, but we're, we're sure that we can control this bias, that we can determine the bias and, and, and apply any necessary correction and at the same time, we get a factor of five more data. Okay, so that's that's of course the the the, the positive, and with that we can uh, uh, get much more statistical precision on our on our measurements. I hope that that roughly explains the situation with 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 pileup. Yes, let's go on. I think you can. Good. Explain. All right. So. Um, I think I mentioned pretty much the rest uh, on this slide, so let's let's move on. So, in addition to the vertex detector, uh, we've got we've got further uh, tracking stations. Those are uh, uh, silicon stations before and after the magnet, and after the magnet, these are complemented by by straw tube trackers. And this magnet is a is a, a warm uh, dipole magnet with a field of of, of four Tesla meters. Um, bending in the in, in the horizontal plane and that gives us a momentum uh, measurement of, of of very high precision as you as you can see here so that's that's the tracking system but then one of the key uh, assets for for lhcb is the particle identification system and here we've got two ring imaging cherenkov detectors so they use uh, cherenkov radiation which is emitted by uh, charged particles traveling faster than the speed of light in a medium. This medium here are, are two different gases. Um, and, and this simply, uh, this effect is related to the velocity of the particles. So basically we get a velocity measurement from these detectors. Combining that with a momentum measurement from the tracking stations allows us to deduce the mass hypothesis for, for these particles. And of course, the mass tells us whether we're talking about a pion, a kaon, a proton, uh, or, or any other uh, charged particle. Okay, so that, that's very important. This pion kaon separation, I'll come back to later on, I'll show you uh, the, the impact of that. Uh, that's, that's very important. We have calorimeters that uh, give us electron photon pi zero separation. Obviously, the pi zeros themselves don't travel to the calorimeter, but they. Uh, mostly decay into two photons, and we need to distinguish the, the, the sort of two photons coming from a pi zero from a, from a single uh, photon. Otherwise, these are mostly used just in a, in a trigger system. And finally, we've got, we've got muon stations, and I won't bore you with the details of, of, of the performance numbers. Then um, the, the, the final bit is, of course, uh, once a detector has, has recorded a collision, um, we have a lot of data uh, uh, from that detector. So our event size is of the order of 100 kilobytes. Um, 
and we've got more than 10 million collisions uh, per second. So uh, if, if you work that out, um, we have over 10 terabytes of, of data uh, per second from that. Um, however, we only read out uh, uh, 1 million of these uh, events, uh, of, of, of these 10 million, by applying a combination of a hardware trigger from based on a calorimeter and muon information. Then we've got a software trigger in which we do a full event uh, reconstruction and even we, we sort of park our data for a while, then calibrate our detector and then process of the remainder of this trigger in order to be able to, to have the, the most precise selection decisions possible. And what comes out of that is analysis quality data. So we don't need any, any further offline calibration of, of, of data anymore. And uh, of the 1 million that we read out, only 5,000 or so per second are stored uh, for, uh, for analysis. So the challenge we're facing uh, is that about 10% of all events before triggering contain charm particles, because these are uh, uh, very abundantly uh, produced at these sort of center of mass energies. Even beauty particles are a factor 10 less, but that's still a percent of, uh, of, uh, of all of these 10 million uh, per second. So uh, there's loads of them there. And therefore, what we're, what we're choosing with this trigger chain is not we're, we're not searching for particular structures. In, 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 in for some rarity cases, of course, we are. But we are, uh, in uh, many cases, faced with having to identify really the best possible uh, uh, signals and, and have uh, we, we rely on, on a well calibrated detector in order not to waste any of, of, of the many good signal events uh, that, uh, that, that are being produced with, uh, with, with, with this amount. So um, what, what we write out in terms of charm is about 10 to the 10 events uh, per year. So, so that is the, the magnitude of data that we're working with and that allows us to make these high precision measurements. Okay, at this point, I want to move on. Are, are there uh, any, any questions on, on, on the detector be before I go uh, to, the, to the measurements? While, while discussing the measurements, I will, I will frequently come back to, to what I said so far about the, about the detector, but. Yeah, so um, uh, I was at a, a conference last year where they spoke about um, moving from hardware triggers to um, software triggers. I was just wondering what the difference is and what type of advantages do you get from using software triggers as opposed to hardware triggers? Right, a uh, uh, wonderful question, uh, uh, because the hardware trigger is really a, a bit of a pain in the neck, uh, to, to be honest. So what, what we do in this hardware trigger, as you can see here, is uh, uh, we, we reduce from, from over 10 million to, to 1 million events per second. So we have a reduction of over a factor of 10. And the information we have from the calorimeters is very, very crude. It basically just tells us, oh, there was an event that had a hadron in it that had a reasonably high energy. Now, in particular for charm, this is quite a pain because charm tends to have somewhat lower energy than, than uh, uh, the, the B meson decay products or, or B baryons as well. So uh, it's very... Uh, uh, um, uh, per, it, it's got such a poor resolution on this energy that uh, we we throw away uh, um, a lot of a lot of our signals without being able to do anything about it. So so basically, the the, the signal selection efficiency is is immediately hampered by by this hardware trigger. What we're going to do in uh, run three. Is, uh, is, is basically uh, remove this and read out uh, the, the full detector at, uh, um, uh, at uh, uh, this uh, 10 million, or, or uh, in, in fact, it's, it's, it's 30 million uh, events per second, and then do the, do the software trigger 
as is uh, described here. What that allows us is simply uh, to use more information to make cleverer decisions that are more efficient for our signal earlier on. Okay, so this uh, the, the hardware trigger which which gives us uh, uh, a hit of uh, a factor two uh, uh, already at the outset, um, but but then um, uh, uh, beyond that, uh, by by simply the the the, the necessary simplicity of the decisions, uh, easily another factor of two. This factor we immediately get back from this change in, 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 in trigger architecture. Okay, so, so that's, that's why we uh, massively change this uh, and, and read out the full detector at uh, a rate of 40 megahertz, which is, which is the collision rate at the LHC. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It's just uh, I'm wondering if Atlas is, if 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 it increases the the efficiency of 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 getting the right um, of not throwing away potential a uh, data that potentially has signal. Then do do, uh, do the other experiments at LHC are they also considering the same thing? Or? So. Uh, we, we we are the first to do something like that um and it it's not easy to do it because first of all you have to be able to read out the whole detector which is a huge data transport issue and then you need to have the hardware infra the computing hardware infrastructure to process the data at that rate um what atlas uh, and cms do uh, is some way uh, uh um an emulation of, of, of some of this scheme in the way that when I read, when, when I said that uh, when we do this, this uh, uh, calibration step, we sort of park the data for a while, then we, we calibrate our detector and then we process it. In our case, this takes uh, a matter of hours. Uh, there's a safety factor in there. It could take uh, uh, days without problems, but, but it, in, in reality, it takes a couple of hours and then processing continues. Um, what they do is they store some of their uh, uh, data with which has just gone through a core selection on disk and then process that uh, uh, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, different way later on. And by that, they, they sort of buy themselves the, the, the time because their, their trigger infrastructure doesn't allow for, for all of that to be, to be done online. That's one of the thing, uh, uh, things they do. And they also have um, a way of processing some of their data such that it can be read out at, at sort of analysis quality. So they, they've got something, I think it's called trigger level analysis uh, in, in, in the case of Atlas, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so some some of their analyses can be done on, on on trigger level data. In our case, that's that's the case for all analyses. So they they are where possible uh, uh, going a similar uh, way, but uh, um, with those detectors being uh, uh, an order of magnitude more complex in, in in just the number of channels that you have to read out and so on, um, but operating still at the same at the same rate. Uh, this this challenge uh, uh, doesn't doesn't become any easier. But uh, I think uh, if 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 we show this to work uh, well, this is certainly something that other experiments in the future will will look at as well. All right, then let me move on to time dependent uh, CP violation. And before I go to the to the measurement itself, uh, I just want to recap. A couple of basics. So, um, the uh, time dependence is is related to to mixing. And uh, before I can discuss mixing, I need to define um, what what this is. So, what I'm uh, what I have here is um, the flavor eigenstates of of, of a meson. Um, so, uh, I've got a meson indicated M. This could be a, a B meson, a K on, a D meson, what have you. And here is the corresponding anti-meson. So this is the guy that has a definite quark content. So for the B meson, the B meson uh, has the anti-B quark, and the anti-B meson has the B quark. Uh, uh, confusingly enough, but but that's that's how it is. 
But then there are eigenstates of the of the weak Hamiltonian, and they differ from these uh, from these quark eigenstates, um, and uh, they uh, have these have these eigenvalues, and these eigenvalues basically encode the the, the mass of the lifetime. Now these two are are linked uh, uh, by the, uh, uh, by by linear combination uh, with these with these uh, coefficients p and q, and then we can we can look at uh, uh, the various cases that that we have the various mesons which are which are shown uh, here, and what I'm depicting here is the mass difference uh, for these meson states. So we have kaons, we have the B mesons, the B sub S mesons, and, and charm. And this mass difference between the two Hamiltonian uh, eigenstates, that leads to uh, sinusoidal uh, oscillations in the probability that the meson turns into, uh, into the anti-meson. Uh, and then given that this is a cosine behavior, it changes back, and I'll, I'll show that on the, on the next slide how that how that looks like. So that's driven by the mass difference, which is simply indicated here by the separation of these of these peaks. And then there is a, a possible difference in the decay width of of, of these eigenstates, um, and that is shown by the difference in the in the width of these of these peaks. So. This is most visible in the in the Kaon sector, and because this uh, this uh, decay width is the inverse of the lifetime, the broad Kaon state, the Y Kaon state, has a short lifetime and therefore is called K short K S, and the narrow Kaon has a long lifetime and therefore is called K long. Now, that lifetime simply uh, modulates basically the exponential decay and, and, and changes how that how that looks like. So uh, if you then uh, let's skip that if, if you uh, then look at how does this probability look like as a function of decay time I've shown that here. So for the kaon in, in blue it's always the uh, probability for the meson to stay the same meson and uh, in, in, in sort of orange it's the meson uh, turning into uh, into the anti-meson. So it always starts at one and, and, and at zero and you see here for the kaon they seem to converge onto what looks like a constant but this is not a constant this is basically the exponential decay of the k long. It's just so slow that it that it looks flat here. For the b0 you see a single oscillation and then and then nothing else. For the B sub S, the oscillations are very, very fast. This is driven by the mass difference of the uh, of the B sub S, which is, as you can see here, the mass difference is much wider than the width of these. So, so this, this leads to these very, very fast oscillations. And in charm, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm working on uh, a lot these uh, parameters are so small that there is uh, nothing uh, to be seen, but that's that's for another day. So the measurement I want to talk about is the B sub S decay into a pair of kaons. And this measurement has been done with data from 2015 and 16. And here you see the, the, the plot I've just shown. And here you see the measurement. So you see these oscillations here. Um, in the different uh, uh, curves, you see them for, for the uh, B sub S and the anti B sub S in red and in blue. Um, and, and, and you see the, uh, how, how they oscillate and, and, and the, the, the two differ. And you see that this experimental measurement uh, looks very different to the, uh, to, to the theory curve. And that's what I, what, what I want to uh, discuss in a little bit more detail. So. Uh, but before I before I go into why this looks as it does, let me uh, uh, briefly say why we why we make this measurement in the in, in, in the first place. What we're really interested in is the CP violation here, and that is measured by the asymmetry of the two curves. So we we build this asymmetry at every point in time. We just measure the number of uh, B sub S and the number of uh, anti Bs, 
and uh, uh, we, we build this asymmetry. And that's, that's shown here on the right-hand side on the vertical axis. Now the horizontal axis is um, the, the, the decay time uh, minus some, some D0, never mind that, modulo two pi divided by delta ms. What that just means is if, if I go back, I showed you here that we have this, this uh, uh, cosine dependence, sorry, uh, and this cosine here, this x contains delta m, right? That depends on delta m, which uh, is, is the mass difference. So if I go back uh, here, uh, this basically means that I, uh, I, I fold over every uh, oscillation uh, um, that, that we had in the, in, in, in the previous uh, uh, graph here, every, every oscillation I, I, I put on top of each other uh, uh, to be able to, to see this picture uh, more clearly. And then I look at this symmetry and this is what I get, okay? Now, why, why are we interested in this? Um, there are different amplitudes contributing to this uh, decay. There are, there are tree amplitudes and what, what we call penguin amplitudes. And, and what I marked here with, with, with purple are uh, couplings uh, uh, to, uh, using the, the uh, CKM element VUB, which is the one that leads to the strongest uh, uh, CP violating effects in the standard model. So good, good uh, probability that, that we will see a CP violation here. And uh, however, I mentioned earlier, we, we, we're after CP violation beyond the standard model. And this can come in at these, at these quantum loops here. So uh, we can replace this basically by any other set of particles that may be beyond the standard model particles, so long as they couple to uh, a, a, a B bar and turn that into a D bar or an S bar and uh, a UU bar pair. And this is simply governed by, by the uncertainty principle. You, you, you can even have uh, a very heavy particles, of course, contributing in these, uh, in, in, in these uh, quantum loops, like, like in the standard model, we have the, the W boson, which is much heavier than the initial uh, B quark. So in, in theory, you could even put an elephant in there for a very short, of time, short period of time, so long as it couples to, to all these quarks and then you will have uh, uh, found uh, physics beyond the standard model. Right, now let's deconstruct what's, what's going on here a little bit. And to start with, I wanna come back to this impact parameter because when applying a selection based on the impact parameter, what we, what we do is if we, we typically require this impact parameter to take a value greater than a certain threshold for all uh, uh, particles involved. And what happens is this is our normal exponential decay uh, modulated with, with some resolution function. That's why it has a tail to the negative uh, side here. And then if we apply this, this impact parameter requirement, we deplete the region around zero. And then we basically push that uh, distribution to the right. Now, both of these distributions are normalized. That's that's why uh, the, the 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 pink one is 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 higher here. But the important thing is, the 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 pink distribution is no longer a straight uh, exponential decay. Uh, it it misses out this this early decay time region, and that is one of the features you already uh, may have spotted in the in the data distribution that we observe. So this is something we need to correct for. Um, and is, 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 is quite a, quite a non-trivial bias. There are various methods for, for, for dealing with that. I won't go into any detail there, but, but this is something that can lead to quite sizable systematic uncertainties um, due to the uh, uh, accuracy of, 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 of this correction and knowledge of uh, the, the, uh, that correction. The next thing is the decay time resolution. Now this needs to be very good in order to be able to make a plot like this. So let's have a look at the plot. The oscillation period overall here is about 350 femtoseconds. We've got six bins in here. Um, so each bin has a width of around about 60 femtoseconds. And in order to be able to resolve the structure 
in order for the data not to be completely diluted and, and, and migrate from one bin to the next, the resolution needs to be well better than 60 femtoseconds. So that, that sort of gives us uh, the, the target. And now, how is that resolution made up? Well, we measure the decay time as the flight distance times the mass divided by the momentum. Now, the mass, we can forget about that's so either a, a constant, we use the input value, or it's, it, it's got a very small uncertainty. But the flight distance, its resolution is linked to the vertex resolution and in turn then to the, to the impact parameter resolution that I mentioned already. And then on the other hand, we have the momentum resolution, which I also mentioned already, which is of the order of a percent. So, so both are uh, uh, very, very good resolutions. At the end of the day, it boils down to a resolution of about 45 femtoseconds. And that is very much thanks to the combination of this fantastic vertex detector that we have and the, and the tracking stations. So we see that we just about fulfill this requirement. And, and that is why this discovery has only been made now because uh, only uh, with, with LHCB, we, we, we have this resolution required to resolve these, these fast oscillations. The next thing is we need to distinguish B sub S and anti B sub S because if we don't, what we get is this curve here. We get this exponential again, as I said, it's, it's depleted at zero from these impact parameter requirements, but otherwise we get a straight exponential, pretty boring. Only if we can separate BS and anti BS, can we actually measure these, these oscillations. So here's how we, how we separate BS and anti-BS. What happens at the primary vertex is we produce a BB bar pair. And for instance, the, the, the B bar can come together with a strange quark and form a B sub S meson. That strange needs to be produced together with, a, with an anti-strange, which could, for example, produce a K plus. So if we find a K plus, physically near our B sub S in the detector, then we know that was a, 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 that was a, a, a BS. If we find a K minus, then we have an anti BS. Okay, so the K on charge tags, so to say, the flavor of the, of the B sub S. All right. Likewise, the other B, we can look at what that does. That can decay semi-leptonically, in which case the charge of the leptons is coupled to the flavor of the quark. Okay, so in this case, the B will produce negative leptons, and that tells us that the other side then uh, was a BS rather than anti-BS. This B can also decay into a charm quark, and the charm quark decays, uh, for example, into a K minus. It can also decay semi-leptonically. So there are there are various routes that we can that we can look at um, to identify uh, what's what's going on by looking what what happens around the decay uh, we're, we're we're looking at the whole thing together is called flavor tagging and indeed it's very much a case of looking at the big picture and at all these possibilities bring together the information sort of in a in a weighted uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, information. It, it's it's done with a, with a multivariate uh, analysis um, to get one decision out at, at at the end of the day. Again, this needs to be calibrated very carefully um, because any mistake here will of course lead to a dilution of 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 this effect. And you see these oscillations here are much uh, uh, narrower than the, the huge oscillation in, in, the, in the theory plot that I showed earlier. And that comes from the fact that the flavor tagging is something that can't be, uh, can't be perfect, um, but it's good enough to, to, to resolve this. Finally, um, we also have to identify the hadrons. I mentioned that earlier already, and, and I wanna illustrate here how important that is, but also how powerful our hadron identification is. On the top right, you see particles reconstructed under the mass hypothesis of being a kaon and a pion. And that means that what our kaon candidates will have used this particle identification information to be 
identified as a as a kaon. Um, and you see here the, the huge peak of uh, B2 um, K pi decays. You also see in, in orange here BS to KK decays. Now that's the guys down there, uh, very small contribution. But these are the ones that we're interested in. Now, if we change our selection criteria and we say to the second particle, I don't want you to look like a pion, I want you to look like a kaon. Uh, can I request that both uh, of, of, of you fulfill my typical k on criteria, then I change, I, I use the same data set and I get this peak out. Now this peak is dominated by BS2KK, exactly the decay I want to, and this huge decay that was towering over this tiny BS2KK peak earlier has now been uh, reduced to the, to the blue contribution uh, down here. Okay, so what is dominant in one uh, case it can be can be made almost negligible uh, in the other, just by changing the information how we use the information on the on the hadron identification. So you see, this is absolutely powerful, and 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 the the other crucial uh, crucial uh, uh, bit uh, in in here is also the mass um, resolution that we have because. Uh, we're talking about B sub S mesons, which sit uh, at 5,360 MeV, whereas the B sub D meson is at 5,280. So, so there's only a difference of 80 MeV, but, but uh, uh, we, we, we have, to, have to keep them apart in order to be able to identify uh, our, our signals uh, well enough. So with a, with a combination of that, we, we get this, this very clear picture, and this is the input data set to the to the measurement uh, I've shown. Right. At this point, uh, I realize I, I'm, I'm probably uh, already way over time, and, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to finish after this. But I thought I, I, I'd uh, do a little quiz, uh, and if, if, if you want, uh, you can you can go on this menti.com uh, site uh, to. Um, uh, uh, vote on on what you think are the are the important elements for the uh, uh, BS to to J sci phi decay that that's another decay that uh, we're, we're looking at and that contains a J psi which then decays into two muons and the phi that decays into two uh, kaons apologies this phi and that phi they're absolutely the same thing just printed in a different uh, font so um, you you would get to vote on on on, on these five um, these these five things there. Um, now I actually need to have a look at that and see how that's going. No one has voted yet. I don't know. We we don't have an enormously big crowd, so. Um, so yeah, uh, guys, please go on the website and vote on your answer. I think we want it uh, now. Yeah, if you if you if you can if if you want if you can uh, if if not we can uh, we we can also uh, move on. Um, so, yeah, let's move we, on and then we come to come, we come back and see if there are yeah. any answers. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, the rest is uh, um, is much less. So uh, uh, we're. Um, uh, not uh, that far from, from the end. So I want to now move uh, to CP violation in decays and just discuss a couple of things that are, that are relevant there. And I want to discuss that with the example of uh, the discovery of CP violation in charm decays, which was done with D0 to K plus K minus decays and D0 to pi plus pi minus decays. Now these these are the the signal samples um, you see here. These are these are much cleaner than the B samples, uh, and we were able to uh, make this measurement with about sixty million uh, very very pure uh, signal candidates, and this is the asymmetry we measured. So again, it's it's an asymmetry formed in a, a same way as discussed before, and what's shown here is a mass of the D zero pion combination. The pion here is our flavor tagging uh, particle, 
Uh, I, I won't go into uh, in, into detail uh, on on that. Uh, suffice it to say that this this region here is where the signal uh, uh, sits, uh, and and here you see the asymmetry uh, going from from uh, being round about zero uh, to to significantly negative values, and, and and the same thing happens here for the for the pions. Now, what we then do is we calculate the difference in asymmetry between the k on final state and the pi on final state. And why we do that, I'll, I'll explain in a moment. But let me show, first of all, what, what, what the result was. So what you see here is this delta uh, of these two asymmetries, the difference, simply plotted as a function of run block. So that's nothing else than the start of data taking in 2015 to the end of 2018 uh, here. And you see it's different from zero. So, uh, and, and, and it's different by uh, about two per mil, okay? And uh, then uh, via uh, 40 million terabytes uh, of, of data, how we reduced that I've already uh, mentioned, we were able to discover a CP violation. As, as you can see here, this one is, is uh, uh, very significantly uh, different from, from zero. And um, this is uh, quite uh, a remarkable measurement, uh, as, as was pointed out also in the, in the briefing book for the European strategy update. Uh, th this is an exercise uh, uh, where, where uh, the, the European countries looked at what, what they want to do in, in particle physics uh, in, in the coming years. And, and it, was, it was pointed out that this was one of the landmark results coming out from the LHC. Right, so let me describe why we did this measurement of, of, this, uh, of this difference of asymmetries. So this is the asymmetry we, we measured here. And this measured asymmetry to first order we can describe as the, the CP asymmetry. This is the thing we were, we're after, the physics asymmetry of this uh, decay. But we're also, we've also got a production asymmetry of these uh, D mesons. So whether D or anti-D are produced more abundantly, one, one more than the other, that could be the case. And if, if so, that would create uh, an asymmetry that shows up in the measured asymmetry. We can also have a detection asymmetry coming from the final states. If for some reason, the final states are such that I prefer one final state over the anti-final state, then this can uh, again lead to a measured asymmetry, right? And, and I just measure this one thing. I can't uh, uh, distinguish which contribution uh, this uh, uh, measured asymmetry is coming from. Now, this is thankfully negligible uh, because we have uh, with K plus, K minus, and Pi plus, Pi minus, uh, uh, I, uh, CP uh, symmetrical uh, uh, final states. So uh, uh, this, this, this one we can forget about. But then we have a detection asymmetry of the tagging particle. So this is the particle that is used to determine whether we're talking about a D or an anti-D. That is the, the pion that I just mentioned. So that could potentially uh, add an asymmetry. So we need to, we need to constrain these. However, uh, we use the trick here. So by, by doing this difference of, of measured asymmetry, it so happens that this is simply the difference of CP asymmetries because these guys here in the end, they are shared between D to KK and D to Pi Pi. Both are D decays, so same production asymmetry. Both are tagged by a pion, same detection asymmetry. And I said this one is negligible anyway. Okay, so there, there are some subtleties why this is not quite so trivial, but uh, I, I, I won't bore you with, uh, with, with the details there. And you might think, okay, then I don't see anything because I subtract the two effects, but it so happens that at least within the standard model, we expect these uh, effects to be equal and with opposite sign, of equal magnitude and with opposite sign. So measuring the difference is actually the optimal uh, uh, thing to do. And uh, I, I think I, I, I won't go into more details because we're, we're uh, uh, well over time already. You can measure the 
individual uh, asymmetry uh, and try to extract that if you can determine that and not uh, uh, do this difference measurement. And then uh, you can go through a whole host of control modes, bring them all together, and then with a lot of uh, uh, work extract this. This has been done, but I won't go into more detail. I will also not go into the details of the production and detection asymmetries. Um, you can you can look at the slides and and, and, and the references here if you're uh, if you're interested. So let me conclude. Um, what I've shown you was just a tiny snapshot of LHCb's physics, but I thought it was worth focusing just on one aspect, both because it allowed me to to describe uh, a lot of the uh, experimental aspects. Um, but also, otherwise, I, I, I probably uh, um, would have not delivered anything anything useful um, by, by trying to be more comprehensive. This is um, possibly not even a complete list. I might have forgotten something. But if you want to look at uh, what else we're doing, there there are links in the in the corner here to our publications and and a public page that that gives regular highlights uh, of our measurements. I mentioned earlier that uh, we're currently in the process of upgrading the, the experiment. And this here is, is one of the modules we are uh, um, we're, we're, we're building. I'm, I'm just before the lecture out of a meeting where, where it was confirmed that we now got the, the third uh, module uh, in, in construction. Uh, so so we're, we're, we're slowly getting there. Um, uh, and, and, and we hope to have a complete detector in the, in the coming months. And then uh, this will run over the over the next decade. And as I mentioned already, we'll collect a factor of five more data because we'll run with more uh, more proton proton collisions at the same time. What I haven't mentioned is then we also have what we call an upgrade two phase that we plan for the period post 2030. And there we want to go yet another factor of five higher with excuse me, with um, uh, even uh, 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 more complex detector systems. So um, we, we, with that, we, we, we then uh, want to acquire an even larger sample and dig deeper, get, get to more precise uh, measurements of both CP asymmetries, rare processes, and, and, and other things we're, we're, we're looking at. So coming back to uh, CP violation, uh, the, the LHCb detector is specifically designed to do these precision measurements. And that is thanks to, to an excellent mass resolution, decay time resolution, hadron and ID uh, efficiencies and, and, and so on, what, uh, as I've uh, discussed early on in the, in the lecture. CP violation requires the control of, uh, uh, of, of many parameters, uh, flavor tagging, the decay time bias if you do a time dependent measurement, uh, but also potentially production and detection asymmetries uh, if, if, if uh, mostly if you look at time integrated measurements. And LHCb has made two recent discoveries. This was uh, in, in a series of, of quite a number of high profile discoveries, but in particular here in the sector of CP violation, it was the discovery of CHARM CP violation that was made last year which followed the uh, discovery of CP violation in the beauty sector by Babar and Bell in, in, in uh, the early 2000s and uh, in the 1960s uh, in the Kayon sector. And uh, we've also just discovered time dependent CP violation in uh, BS decays, which is one of the uh, last uh, missing pieces of the puzzle. And as I described, that is a particularly sensitive um, uh, decay to physics beyond the standard model through these uh, through these quantum loops. So that that's just from from last month, uh, hot of the press. Uh, but but there's certainly more to come, both with the data that we have already on taper, but then uh, much more with the with the LHCb upgrades, and uh, uh, possibly even uh, with uh, some of you uh, on on board uh, working with us on that. Okay, and, and with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Michael, thanks very much uh, for this lecture, which uh, complements very well uh, the lecture that we, hear, we heard two days ago by Monica. So this is, uh, uh, one can see the powerful uh, 
detector of uh, LHCB in operation to really uh, measure these rare processes with this very high degree of precision is, is really quite impressive. Um, there is a, there was a question on the chat by Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed, you want to talk? Uh, I think he was uh, there. Is the slide before he? The question is uh, all of the um, improvement or upgrade um, expected uh, for LHCB, whether this is in parallel to the uh, LHC high luminosity upgrade or, or upgrade yes. two. Yes, uh, that that that's a very good point. So so uh, indeed, uh, if 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 you know the the uh, uh, schedule of of the uh, LHC uh, high luminosity upgrade, you you will have realized that that what we're planning here is a little bit out of phase with that, but we we can be out of phase because as I, as I mentioned earlier, we we currently operate at a much lower uh, uh, instantaneous luminosity by separating the beams, and we'll continue to do that, even for this uh, for for this initial uh, uh, factor five more. We still don't need to put the beams fully uh, head on, and then when the uh, when the LHC moves to its high luminosity uh, phase in the in the mid twenty twenties, um, basically. All we have to do is displace the beams a little bit more um, because uh, uh, they're, they're, they'll be uh, uh, more more oomph in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the accelerator basically. So so uh, for us, we, we expect to run more or less at a at a steady state. Um, and but but then of course the high luminosity LHC is an opportunity also for us. And if we can overcome this challenge of the pileup. And that is what we plan with this upgrade too, uh, and make use of this additional luminosity that is that is there. Then this gives us uh, this this unique opportunity of of going uh, uh, to these even greater uh, data sets, and 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 thereby uh, reducing our uncertainties uh, by, by by quite a bit more. And the way we do that is uh, fundamentally by introducing basically a fourth dimension to our reconstruction. So many of our subdetectors for this upgrade too will have precise timing information. And I mentioned already uh, earlier on when we discussed uh, pileup a little bit uh, and, and how it's important to tune the readout to the nanosecond uh, on, uh, on our silicon detectors. That is, that is correct. But if you think of a silicon detector that has a resolution of a tenth of a nanosecond, then all of a sudden you can actually distinguish where these particles came from, whether they came from an interaction that happened close to that sensor or whether they came from an interaction that happened, let's say 20 centimeters further away, okay? And if you can distinguish those two cases, you don't care anymore uh, about about this pileup, and you can you can work with a much greater pileup, and that's exactly what we're planning for this uh, for this upgrade too. And likewise, we'll do the same uh, with uh, 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 some of the other detectors, basically to to um, reduce the the, the pileup back to the the manageable levels by by if you want being able to look at it in, in, in snapshots of time where each snapshot uh, only has uh, uh, fewer uh, uh, collisions. So I hope that that roughly uh, out outlines what, what we have planned for, for our upgrades. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Meiki, you want to talk now? Uh, yes. So please, Prof, uh, tell us briefly about uh, the rare decays and why they are so important. Um, in looking for CP, I mean, in looking for uh, CP. Okay, so um, rare, rare decays uh, are a much wider uh, uh, area than just looking for, uh, for, for CP violation. Um, there are also rare decays where, where we look for CP violation. And, and in general, um, with, with rare decays, uh, you, uh, you, you, you look for, for effects that are, that are small in the standard model, be it uh, 
a rare branching fraction like like this bs to mu mu that only happens roughly uh, uh, three times 10 to the minus nine of all decays or, or, or other such rare processes. The basic principle is you're trying to find effects that are different from the, uh, from, from the prediction. Now, if you imagine that you have um, an effect from beyond the standard model that let's say uh, adds to the uh, decay probability by one times 10 to the minus nine. Now, if you add that to a rare decay, uh, and that changes its occurrence from three times 10 to the minus nine, which is expected to four times 10 to the minus nine, then that is something you can, uh, you can measure uh, 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 quite well if you've isolated uh, uh, that, that decay. That is, that is a large relative difference. And that is sort of the, the signal we're looking at. In fact, BS to mu mu, is still open uh, uh, whether that is at exactly at the standard model level or maybe a little bit different. That, then in contrast to that, if you have a not rare decay, a, a frequently occurring decay, which is affected by, by the same beyond the standard model effect, but which happens, let's say, at a rate of 10 to the minus 5 normally, and then you add 10 to the minus 9 to that, well, that's such a small change uh, that uh, you, you, you probably uh, will, will, will never notice, okay? That is the power of rare decays, these large relative effects. And um, in these rare processes, we, of course, uh, pick out the ones that we can reconstruct well, but we can reconstruct them so cleanly that, that um, we, we, can, we can distinguish uh, 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 the, uh, the, the impact of, uh, of, of new physics uh, uh, much, much more easily. Um, it's also a, a case of, if you look at the related statistical uncertainties, what, uh, um, if, if you are able to have a rare decay without much background, then uh, your sensitivity scales with uh, the number of events straight away rather than with the square root of the number of events um, uh, we, which, which happens typically uh, um, when, when uh, you're uh, uh, doing um, a counting experiment with, 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 a, with a, a, a more prolific decay. So um, uh, that, that's, that's really the, the, the power of, 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 of rare decays is finding large relative differences due to actually small effects that would be completely invisible elsewhere, but that start to show up in, 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 some, in some rare processes. Okay, and then there are, there are various different things that we can look at. We can look at um, lepton uh, uh, flavor violation, for example. So we can look at things that, <coughs> excuse me, um, don't uh, conserve lepton flavor. So, so Instead of going to mu plus mu minus, we could look at mu plus e minus, um, and uh, uh, other other such processes. Um, none of them have, have have been found because they they would be <coughs> unambiguous signs for for new physics. Already, case can can be used uh, to to look for uh, new particles if you if you have. Um, uh, lepton number violating decays. So, so you, you, you have a decay uh, uh, of a B hadron going to a lighter hadron and say a mu plus and another mu plus. So you actually have two more leptons or anti-leptons in that case than uh, you, you had uh, initially. Um, and this could be uh, uh, an indication of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, a heavy, uh, um, no, they, 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 this is uh, uh, um, linked to, to um, uh, Majorana neutrinos, for example. Uh, but there, there, there are there are loads of signatures that they can then link to certain to certain models, uh, and 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 so there, there there's a whole host of different questions that you that you answer uh, with 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 ready cases. It's not just one single. Uh, one, one single item. Um, so I think we have talked uh, quite a bit. Um, Marco, I just want to ask you to comment uh, in the minutes or two on, 
on uh, other physics program on you know on top of uh, the flavor physics i think you also have uh, a very interesting other physics uh, in bsm searches and so forth so, so just to tell, yeah to give us a yeah a glimpse of you know the the powerful of uh, of of the detector to really extend in in some of these other regions okay so um, the, the, the other areas to, to highlight maybe uh, are the, the spectroscopy area where um, we uh, look at excited uh, hadrons, for example, but also at exotic hadrons. So uh, uh, that, that includes these tetraquarks and pentaquarks. So um, actually LHCB was, was the first experiment to, to observe uh, uh, pentaquarks. So, um, th this is something that is not physics beyond the standard model. Uh, in fact, on the, on, on the contrary, this, this has been predicted by, by Gell Mann in, in, in his 1964 uh, seminal paper, um, but nevertheless ha hadn't been seen until uh, a, a few years ago. And, and, and there, um, every few months or so at the moment, we, we seem to be finding uh, new particles of this, uh, of this kind. Other things uh, of interest that, that we're doing is, is, for example, in electroweak physics, this is very much complementary to, to ATLAS and CMS because we focus naturally on, on electroweak physics in the forward direction. And uh, you, you have uh, uh, quite a few effects that are linked to a forward-backward asymmetry um, of uh, uh, the, the, the collision process. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, you, um, uh, th therefore, th th this, this asymmetry is then very much enhanced in the forward direction. So even though our data samples are, are much smaller than, than those of Atlas and CMS, we get similar sensitivity to, to, the, uh, to the effects. And therefore, uh, bringing all the three experiments together really gives us a, a powerful insight into what happens with uh, with, with these electroweak uh, uh, bosons. Similarly, we can do a little bit of uh, Higgs physics, in particular Higgs to to charm anti charm, which hasn't been seen yet and probably won't be for a while if it's uh, uh, understand model level. But that is something uh, thanks to our hadron identification. Uh, uh, that we may well play uh, uh, a leading role in. But finally, maybe uh, I, I would highlight um, the uh, uh, proton gas uh, uh, things we do. What, what we do there is in the uh, vertex locator region, I, I discussed how the detector sits in a secondary vacuum and then we have the primary vacuum of the LHC. Now, what we can do in LHCB is we can inject tiny portions of gas into that vacuum. So we have a cloud of gas forming there. And then the protons from the LHC, they collide with those gas uh, nuclei, basically. And so we get proton helium, uh, proton neon, uh, proton argon collisions, all sorts. Uh, and, and, and these are uh, extremely relevant, uh, um, for instance, uh, for, for astro uh, particle physicists uh, to, to uh, mimic things that are happening in cosmic ray showers, for example. So they're, they're very important uh, measurements for that community. Uh, and, and, and similarly, we, we uh, of course, also participate in heavy ion collisions, so, so proton lead and uh, even, even by now lead lead uh, collisions. And again, with our instrumentation in the forward uh, region, we can give that field uh, a, a very specific look at uh, uh, a number of questions rel related to, to quark gluon plasma and, 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 and uh, the, that, that sort of area. I think that's, that's roughly outlining the, 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 the main things aside from, from, from rare decays and CP violation. Um, excellent, uh, Marco. Thanks very much. Um, I think uh, our participants uh, now they've got a very good uh, overview of all of the physics that can happen at uh, LHCB with uh, the strong focus on uh, 
uh, uh, flavor physics and, and, and CP validation, which is also one of the very important questions we want to address regarding matter and antimatter symmetry and, and, and how that you know, relates to our understanding of the universe. So this is really, really mm -hmm. excellent. So um, on that note, I would like to thank you, Marco, for being with us. Thanks for- Thank you yeah. very much for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Thanks uh, for mentioning, mentioning the lepton photon uh, uh, conference, which will happen next year in Manchester. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we hope that we we'll have some of our students and alumni uh, to be able to participate uh, in that in that conference. Um, and we hope to have you um, when we when the time is right and we can have an in-person African School of Physics. Uh, we hope you 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 will be with us. So. Um, Marco was supposed to come. Also, he was one of our invited uh, lecturers, lecturers and, and speakers. Uh, so we hope to have him when, uh, when, when we can actually resume the school. It, it would certainly be a great, great uh, pleasure to, to, to come in person. Excellent. All right, so um, I suggest we stop for now and thanks uh, everybody for the participation. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank, thanks, thanks very much bye again. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye.